give entirely too much responsibility to our doctors for keeping us healthy. We eat bad food, and we expect to be able to take a pill to lower our cholesterol, to regulate our blood sugar. We rely on surgical techniques to cut skin cancers out of us and to help us with our weight problems. We don't sleep enough, and we often don't get the best nutrition. But hey, we have a backup plan in the form of antibiotics if our immune systems take a crash. But I would argue it's not working very well. We, we are not as fit and as healthy as we should be. Our doctors are not keeping us healthy. Now, I, I work with a lot of doctors uh, on trying to help them find ways to better engage their patients in their own medical care. Interestingly, I have never talked to a group of patients about how they might be more engaged in their medical care. And don't get me wrong, your doctor cares. Your doctor wants you to be healthy. Your doctor's job depends on you staying healthy. But your life is centered on you being healthy. So your vitality, your health, is more important to you than it is to your doctor. What I want to share with you today is a framework for getting engaged and being healthier. And it's something that the medical professionals are well aware of, but for some reason it seems not to really filter out to patients and to regular people. And it's really simple. If we want to make changes in our health care, and if we want to be healthier as people, we really need to pay attention to just three things. Information, motivation, and strategy. Now, the first one, information, I mean, it seems really simple, right? And it is, in a way. But if people don't know what it is that they need to do or what it is that they should be doing, they're not going to be able to do it. If you ask patients what they wish they got from their healthcare providers that they don't get, one of the top things that they say, in fact, almost all patients say this, is that they wish they had more information. They feel like they don't get enough information from their doctors and their other healthcare providers. Now, the interesting thing is, if you ask them as a follow-up question, what do you do to try to get this information that's so lacking, the vast majority of them don't really have a plan for that. They don't really do too much. So I think that's kind of interesting. Another thing that patients say that they really wish was different about their healthcare is the amount of time that they have with their providers. So patients almost universally feel that they don't have enough time with their doctor. Doctors feel that pressure too. They really feel that pressure and they wish that they had more time with their patients. They feel that they could give higher quality care if they had time. This first point isn't going to magically give you more time with your doctor, but what it can do is help you use the time that you do have efficiently. If you call into a radio show, you're going to talk to a screener, well, and the screener will first of all determine whether you even get on the air, but if they decide to put you on the air, they're going to spend a little bit of time with you formulating how that precious air time is going to be spent. How do you frame your question or your comment in such a way that it's clear and it's concise? It's short, but it gets to the point and it conveys what needs to be conveyed. That same approach ought to be applied to medicine. And think about, first of all, the information that we want to share. We can't expect people in the healthcare profession to help us if they don't have all the details. So providing the information that would allow a proper diagnosis or allow them to understand what's going on with us is really important. But again, there's that time pressure. So it has to be done quickly, and you don't want to leave stuff out. So writing it down is really good. Uh, when you come into the doctor's office, it's kind of high stress, and you feel that time pressure, so it's easy to forget things. Write down your questions as well. You probably have things that you want to ask. Having a list can give you a little courage if you're shy about asking things. It can also remind you of what it is that you want to ask. Jotting down some key points of things that your doctor shares with you is also important. Patients forget a huge amount of what takes place in the encounter and what they're told. It's, it's actually really surprising if you read the stats. But it's not surprising if you think about what's going on. Things are rushed. You're probably a little nervous. You might be wearing a weird paper outfit. That's a little distracting. So you, you shouldn't be expected to remember everything. But you, know, you can write it down and you can look at it later. So those are all things that can help us get through this information piece, but you know well that knowing what you need to do isn't enough. 
we need to be motivated. This is where probably we play the most key role in this partnership with healthcare professionals. Your doctor does not know what motivates you, but you know what motivates you. And it's very individualized, so it's going to be different things for different people. You might want to be out feeling good, feeling light on your feet, and running a half marathon, doing it with your friends, doing it for a great cause. That can be really motivating. You might want to play ball with your grandkids someday. That might be really important to you. That's a different kind of motivator. You might want to go to your high school reunion and give everybody whiplash. That's a different kind of motivator. Whatever it is, you're the person who knows what that is. And so taking a little time to think about why you want the things you want is important. It's also important to keep in mind that although long-term goals are good, but if I'm thinking ahead to playing with grandchildren, that's still a ways off. And so we oftentimes might need shorter-term motivators, particularly if you're feeling good right now, the idea of avoiding something years in the future or being able to do something way off in the distance. It's not as powerful as something that's more immediate. So you can find immediate motivators or things that are short-term, or you can create things. You can say, OK, once I've done this, I'll get tickets to this con uh, concert. Or once I've done such and such, or I've lost this amount of weight, or I'm at this level of fitness, I'll buy these new clothes that will help with my whiplash effect at my high school reunion. So keeping those in mind will really help. But that's not enough either. There are a lot of things that I know are the right thing to do. I'm convinced of that. I have the information, and I'm motivated to do them. But sometimes they still don't happen. So the third piece of this three-stage model is the strategy piece. We have to think about how we will implement any given plan. If we don't think about that, it's not going to happen. And there are a few, few things here that, that seem to be pretty effective. One is to be concrete. And by be concrete, I mean write post-it notes, put up little signs in places where you'll see them that will remind you and will keep that goal at the forefront so that you remember what that motivator is. That helps. Making promises, public promises, to other people makes you accountable in a way that you're often not, at least I'm not, accountable to myself. Having a support network, it can be those people to whom you're accountable, but having people who are there to encourage you when your own motivation is flagging, and who can celebrate with you when things go well and you've, you've had a victory and you've accomplished one of those goals, that in itself is very rewarding. Another thing I'd like to point out is that self-efficacy, I know I'm using a psychology term now, but, but the sense that you can do it is incredibly important. If, if people don't believe that they can do something, they're really unlikely to even try. And if they do try, it's kind of half-hearted. So having a sense that you're able is really important. And your support group can improve your self-efficacy a little bit, because they can tell you, I know you can do it. I have faith in you. And, and that does work a little bit. But it's the weakest form of increasing self-efficacy. A stronger method, what, what we call a vicarious uh, attainments. So seeing other people who you perceive as similar to yourself being successful. When I see someone who's kind of like me doing something and succeeding, I, I have more confidence that maybe I could do it too. So that's useful. But the strongest method for improving your own sense of I can do it is to actually experience success. So if you think about a long-term goal or a health goal that might stretch over your entire life, yeah, that's a little daunting. And when are you going to be successful? When you finally died, but you were 100 when you did it? It's better if you can set interim goals, little things where you can succeed and where you can have that experience of attainment and goal accomplishment. And that, in and of itself, really empowers you. It makes you feel like, hey, that was great, and I can do it again, and I'm going to do this next step now. So breaking things into smaller steps is a great strategy for helping you accomplish a bigger, larger, longer-term goal. Healthcare providers can be really helpful here because they might be able to hook you in with classes or with support groups that can help you. They might be able to 
provide you with equipment or medications or maybe help find cost savings on those if, if financial issues are a barrier. So pulling as many people as you can into the equation and being broad-minded when you strategize and when you try to troubleshoot and think ahead, what could go wrong, what will be my plan for dealing with that, will all be really helpful. The things that we care about really consume us. We plan for them. We spend a lot of time thinking and dreaming about them. Uh, if you think about buying a car, you probably do a lot of research. At least I sure did when I bought my last car. I was on Consumer Reports. I was everywhere. I was talking to people. I gathered a lot of information. If you think about vacations, I mean, you gather information, and you're dreaming about it, too. You're, you're thinking, you're, you're living that beach way before you get to the beach, and that can motivate you to get through a hard day at work, and then you find out you got overtime, and okay, you can get through it. You've got something that you're looking forward to. That degree of diligence needs to go into the way we care for our health. We need to think ahead. We need to plan. We need to try to motivate. We need to garner information and support in the same way that we do when we're buying a car or a big screen TV or planning for a vacation. Your doctor cares, for sure. And I'm not saying that health care professionals aren't important. They absolutely are. But insofar as they're experts in certain realms, we are also experts. You are the only person who knows your life story, who knows what your symptoms feel like, who, who knows and understands the constraints on your own life, what are you capable of doing, what's not going to work given the job that you have or the other obligations in your life. You're a partner in your own healthiness, whether you like it or not. This very simple model, I am convinced, can do a lot to help us be better partners and to maybe help us reclaim majority ownership in our, in our own wellness, and our own well-being. If we can make that kind of a commitment, we will be able to reap rewards that are way beyond what we would have expected. And I think that a three-part strategy is simple enough that we can hold it, in our minds, it's not complicated, it's not a lot of pieces, it's not, I mean, this doesn't even have to be written down because information motivation strategy, that's easy to remember. And I just want to encourage each and every one of you to try to grab that back. I mean, you, you wouldn't select a healthcare provider that was disengaged, someone that was not putting in the time and the effort. Why on earth would you settle for that on your side of the partnership? Thank you.